Welcome to this webinar on transformer-based hybrid modeling control of evolving nonlinear processes. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Joseph Song Il Kwan, an associate professor in chemical engineering and the Kenneth R. Hall Career Development Professor at Texas A&M University. Professor Kwan earned his PhD in chemical engineering from UCLA, an MS in electrical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, and a dual bachelor's degrees in chemical engineering and mathematics from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. His research is at the forefront of advanced methodologies, including multi-scale modeling, digital twins, hybrid modeling, sparse model identification, and fault prognosis. He applies these methodologies to diverse industries such as pulp and paper, oil and gas, electrochemical, and pharmaceuticals. Professor Kwan received numerous awards and accolades, including the 2021 Hanwha Non-Tenure Faculty Award, multiple Engineering Genesis Awards, and the TEES Young Faculty Fellow Award. His contributions to multidisciplinary research and education are widely recognized. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kwan. Thank you, John, for a very nice, very kind um, introduction. And I'm glad that I'm here to talk about uh, one of the most interesting research topics that I'm working on right now. Um, I guess you hear me well, right? Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, transformer, uh, which has been really the the driver for all the success of the ChatGPT or even the uh, the stock market in terms of Nvidia and so, and so forth. And then I'll talk about how they can be used for hybrid model development and how they can be used for the control of basically dynamically changing like evolving nonlinear processes. So this is a line of my talk, and then let me start with a brief introduction of a hybrid model. So since I'm from Texas, I mean, I'm still in Texas. Um, so I'm going to start with some examples, which is originated from uh, Texas. So uh, like this is uh, the fracking or the hydraulic fracturing. So typically, um, this taking place uh, um, around the 3,000 meter below the surfaces. And then the major difference between the shale and like conventional oil reservoir is the shale is more like the layer by layer, uh, like a deposition. So basically in order to extract like oil or gas from this layer, you have to do a particular uh, technique called the fracking, um, followed by something called is like horizontal drilling. So I'm not going to talk too much technical details about the fracking processes, but I'm just want to use it as a motivating example. So suppose that I want to do like a fracking, then it will be consistent of like three stages, like perforations, which is like you are creating like a perforations, like through some artificial explosions and through which you are going to introduce a lot of water with a high flow rate, with a high pressure. And if you can see this particular kind of a blue area, of course, the majority is like water, but there's like a, something called like a viscosifying agent to, to really adjust the, uh, the viscosity of this, uh, the water, like fracturing fluid. But on top of that, there's this black dot. Um, and the black dot basically means like a propant. And where the propant is nothing but like a scent. So basically, uh, while there is a pumping, which is like a momentum, then the this fractures will further and further propagate it. However, once you stop the pumping, then basically uh, all the waters within this uh, the fractures will leak off. And eventually, uh, all the propant will stay there to pry open uh, these fractures against like a rock formation, like a stress. So basically, the entire fracking process is nothing but like replacing the formation with ultra low permeability, uh, like a region with uh, this like, artificially generated like a pack bed whose uh, porosity or the permeability can be determined by the size or placement of this propant. So as you can see, if you were to like uh, provide some first principle model for this process, I mean, you can use like a very simple models like uh, called like Perkins current and Erdogan, like PK model, or because the propane, which is like a sand, it will be also transported. So in order to describe how the sand will defect or settle uh, both into horizontal and the vertical directions, you basically have to solve this uh, particular PD. So, I mean, if you talk to like petroleum engineers or geomechanics, geophysics, or even civil engineers who do like rock mechanics, these are very uh, simple, like, you know, CSTR or the PFL type like uh, stuff. But basically, I'm just introducing these examples to um, um, 
guide our discussion to a particular topic, which is um, if you think about like a fluid leak up, I mean, the way that uh, the water would leak off, I mean, the rate and the, how fast they are in the particular positions and so on, it's actually like a very important parameter that highly affect the fracture width and uh, with the wall bore. And so basically, this will determine the, how much of uh, the area we can stimulate through these hydraulic fracturing processes. But then if you take a look at the first equations, there's like a, this term like a U. So this U is the fluid leak off terms. And as you can see, I denoted that it's actually a function of a position as well as the time. So, you know, in order to find like a parameter of a U is actually quite challenging. So uh, speaking of which, if you really think about like uh, uh, how, what we could do to kind of do like this kind of modeling, suppose that we have some working uh, first principle model, but there are a particular part of the first principle model, which is not uh, very clear or which contains some uncertainty, what should we do? Then basically there are like two schools of thought. The first one is the first principles approach. And the second one is the, uh, the data driven approach, which has received a lot of attention recently, right? So my own viewpoint in terms of these two approach is the following. So if you think about the first principle model, a modeling approach, it basically means that you will take into account a lot of physics, like through mass energy balance equation, thermodynamics, kinetics, and many others. So basically, uh, when we do like a modeling, it basically means that we have to determine the model structure, right? However, if you think about like a data-driven approach, like initially, we have like infinite degree of freedoms, right? However, in order to really enjoy the luxury of having access to infinite degree of freedoms, like machine learning approaches, like you should have access to a large amount of quality data. But if you are like a modeler from industry or from academia or from uh, through collaboration with other experimental group as a PSC people, you kind of encounter the situations where you do have a data, but basically you don't have a lot of data or you do have a lot of data, but they are not like quality data. Or if you're from the like industry, basically you can collect a lot of data from the commercial scale. But the thing is that the commercial scale basically means that you are producing or running the reactor or the processes at a particular conditions, which will allow you to create a lot of uh, golden bats. So basically, even though you have a lot of data, there are, a lot of, I mean, there are not a lot of like variations in the data. So from which we cannot utilize those uh, data for like a model training and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, in terms of data driven approach, we do have a flexibility in terms of model structure, but we should have access to a large amount of quality data to train the model. So these two kind of uh, characteristics are very apparent. And with that, um, if I were to summarize like the pros and cons of each approaches, so for the first principle model, there's always like a system knowledge gaps, right? And then for the machine learning approaches, uh, we have a data quality dependencies. So this is my like a favorite spectrums to summarize this point is that if you talk about the first principle model, you have like 100% dependencies on the physics with almost zero dependence on data. On the other hand, if you talk about the machine learning model, it's actually the other way. Then basically we can think about this common ground, which is kind of standing in between these two columns. And Motivated by that, uh, today what I'm going to talk about is a hybrid model, which is like a uh, best of both world approaches. So we will basically combine the system independent physics of the first principle model for broad generalizability and interpretability with the system specific process data to basically learn something called latent chemical mechanism. So basically, I, like I'm going to call the uh, the missing physics that was not able to be captured by the first principle model as the latent chemical mechanism, okay? So uh, the particular structure that I'm gonna talk about today, although there are many variations of a hybrid modeling approach like series, parallel, or the even integrate and so on and so forth, but today I'm gonna talk about uh, like a serial approaches primarily, okay? So the idea is that suppose I have a sub first principle model, which is working fine, but this is not great. So for example, if my colleague came to my office one day and asked like if I have any model for some new gas membrane systems, then basically even though I don't have a lot of experiences about such systems, if I Google maybe half a day or a couple of days, I can find a reasonably working uh, first principle model. 
But the problem is that uh, it is not fully replicating all the experimental results. Then basically, we want to improve the first principle model so that we can have actually a good match with the experimental data. So to that extent, what we are trying to do is that we know that there is a gap between this first principle model and actual data, and that particular gap can be um, uh, can be captured by developing this like a neural network. So basically, the idea is that if, for example, some parameters or some states of this first principle model are considered to be like constant, but then in reality they are not a constant because uh, they may vary depending on some conditions like pH or other like solvent concentrations and so on and so forth. Then basically those uh, um, hidden chemical mechanisms can be captured by considering something called like effective parameters or effective states. So here, what I mean by effective is that rather than considering, for example, like overall heat transfer coefficient like in CSTR as a constant, we can vary them with the space or we can vary them with the time because uh, that's what it is. So if we have a very precise idea about which physics we have to consider within the first principle model, I mean, only the sky is the limit. However, if we want to go with this particular model, but then we are going to lump all the uncertainties by varying the, the say, the parameters uh, with respect to time or space, we can actually improve the accuracy of the first principle model like significantly. So this is the kind of idea of this approach. And if I were to provide a, a couple of uh, uh, characteristic or the uh, of uh, this hybrid modeling approach is that the point of integration between these two models, whether through the parameters or states can be guided by domain knowledge or the statistical analysis. So. For example, we were talking about the fracking where we are already know that the, uh, the leak alpha rate contains a lot of uncertainty. Then we can basically uh, try to estimate how those uh, leak alpha rate changes with the time and space from the neural network and they can be integrated with the first principle model. So the one thing that I want to highlight here is that typically we don't have, a, I mean, we do have an input to first principle model and the output from the first principle model. We do have it as an experimental result or something but basically we cannot measure these parameters in reality. So basically when you actually train this hybrid model, you cannot just train this neural network by using input and parameter because parameters are not measurable, right? So instead what you have to do is that you will start with some uh, initial condition for the hyperparameters of the neural network and using the input, you are going to have uh, initially very poor guesses for the parameters which will be used within the first principle model. And then of course, initially the outputs are, I mean, the predictions will be really bad, but based on which we are going to do like a back propagations to further adjust the hyperparameters within this neural network and then from which these parameters will be kind of uh, further trained. So uh, the only way that you can train this neural network or the hybrid model is by running the first principle model every time you train the neural network. So it becomes computationally very expensive. So. I mean, we are also working on the way to reduce the, uh, the computation efficiency of the first principle model, because sometimes we have to use like a DFT or the AIMD all the way to the safety calculations. So with that, uh, the estimated parameters or states have uh, uh, the, the physical significance in the first principle model because we directly uh, consider these parameters. And then once these parameters are identified, then basically, I mean, we can uh, use these parameters to um, determine the uh, the model output. And compared to say like a fully data-driven approaches where only the neural network is used, this hybrid modeling approach basically, uh, I would say the, the, the contribution by the neural network versus the first principle model is maybe like one to nine or two to eight. So I would say, um, compared to say like a physics informed neural network where the backbone is still like a neural network here in this particular hybrid modeling approach, the backbone is like a first principle model. And then we are trying to improve the accuracy of this first principle model without unnecessarily adding a lot of physics. So with that, uh, this is like a back propagation step, but due to the interest of time, I'm not going to talk much about the details, but if you're interested, you're more than welcome to contact me and I will share the paper. So with the hybrid modeling approach, I will talk about how it can be applied to many different systems. So maybe the first one is the parameter estimation. So we were talking about the fracking and then I'm going to revisit it. 
So the idea was that we want to estimate how the leak off rate changes spatial temporally, I mean, with the space and also time. So on the left hand side, uh, this is kind of result. And if you take a look at the right hand side, this is the leak off rate at a particular uh, the location positions. So you see that the leak off rate changes with time in a very uh, weird uh, fashion. But then if you compare the actual leak off rate versus the predicted one by the hybrid model, uh, our hybrid model was able to capture this behavior fairly well. And as a result, when you use it along with the first principle model, which basically means this is the result from the hybrid model, you can see that uh, the width, how it changes, it particularly well bore. So the well bore is the, uh, the outermost zone of the pipe, like, and then you see that it actually matches fairly well. So that's the first result, but then, you know, if somebody asks, okay, so I am because uh, claiming that the hybrid model has a very good extrapolation capability because the backbone is first prince model and then only the machine learning is trying to improve the uh, the model, the modeling um, power by capturing the, uh, the hidden chemical mechanism. So what happens when we actually uh, compare the result um, against the operating conditions, which has never been used for the model training? So here, I mean, you see that we actually compared the modeling result at a conditions which has never been used for training. And if you compare the one with the actual width, only the hybrid model shows actually very good performance. And then as you can see, when we compare the result with the black box model, of course, like it does not show the result because the condition has never been used for the black box model training. So as you can see, hybrid model has a very good extrapolation capability. And uh, I'm gonna talk about how hybrid modeling can be used for the biochemical, like a fermentation processes. So, I mean, there are like a lot, a lot of people working on the fermentation process um, as their favorite research topic. But for those of you who are not familiar with the fermentation, um, if you take a look at like a bioprocess textbook or the reaction engineering textbook, then you will see like uh, some equations like this, which is like nothing but different equations. And you kind of describe how the biomass or S, so S is like substrate, which is like a food to the microorganism and P is product of V is volume. So, I mean, this is like a very representative, like simplified uh, the model, but you know, you may need like uh, 10 or more different equations to describe how different species uh, within the fermentation processes like grow with time. And the one thing is that here, like a lot of the parameters like a mu, which is a specific growth rate or Y, which is like a yield coefficient, they're considered to be like constant in textbook. But if you actually think about the real fermentation process, the growth rate of a microorganism is influenced by the concentration of a substrate and then dissolve the oxygen. So basically what I'm trying to say is that if the, the environment has enough food like substrate or enough oxygen, then the microorganism may tend to grow in a very aggressive manner. On the other hand, if uh, either of these two are lacking, then they may not grow as aggressive as the former cases. So basically all these like uh, practical situations has not been taken into account when we use this kind of first principle model. Although this is okay to use it for like a very hypothetical, very ideal situations. So like what I'm trying to do is that since we know that uh, the specific growth rate of a uh, microorganism, mu, is actually a function of the food available and the dissolved oxygen available. So we're trying to find these functions, F, by using the hybrid modeling approach. So here, the hidden or the latent chemical mechanism is how these functions uh, relate these independent variables and then like a dependent variable. So to the extent, like what we did was that, well, we have some like collaboration with the commercial scale, I mean, the companies who, who do have a commercial scale fermentation processes. So they provide the data and then we, using the data, I mean, we kind of soft proof that this first principle model is not sufficient. And in order to find that this particular function F, which is missing, we train the neural network DNN uh, by running the entire, this hybrid modeling framework. So the result of being that we were end up uh, kind of estimating these three parameters. So this particular example is that we actually have many parameters to estimate, but since we only have a few measurements, we cannot estimate all of them due to the identifiability issues. So basically we have to do like a statistical analysis, which is nothing but 
try to find the sensitive parameters. I mean, the more sensitive parameters that which we adjust, we can have a very good prediction power uh, on the output values. So according to the analysis, this three promise like a mu max, two mu max values, and then one yield coefficient. If we vary those parameters with respect to time, then we, it is expected that the simulation result like prediction power would be um, enhanced like significantly. So this is actually the result obtained from the hybrid model. And as you can see, while they were, I mean, previously considered to be constant values in the existing first principle models, but we varied them with respect to time. And as a result, we were able to have a much better result, which we presented in the following slide. So here, I want to make one note is that if somebody like say the hardcore bio people, I mean, look at this result and say, well, this does not seem to be correct because for example, like this red curve cannot vary this much. If a she or a he has a such evidence, then we can immediately take into account that evidence as a constraint when we train this deep neural network. So what we are trying to do is that without violating the the general consensus, like we are trying to take into account all the domain knowledge that are available from the literature, including the, you know, like reasonable first principle model. And then we are trying to enjoy the allowed degree of freedoms in terms of varying, say, you know, a couple of parameters by, by so much. And as a result, we expect that the overall, the hybrid model has a very good prediction power. So I would say this is more like an engineering solution so rather than like what we are proposing like fundamentally different way to do the modeling because like, you know, we are not doing modeling for modeling. I mean, of course, sometimes we do modeling to have better ideas, but most likely once you have a model after we have a reasonable understanding of the new process, then we are going to use it for design of experiments like process control, process design or many other things. So, I mean, we can try to incorporate many physics, like additional physics, but that itself can make the model to be overfitted. So what we're trying to do is like, given that we have uh, some reasonably working first principle model, but we are not happy about that, what can we do how, uh, in terms of uh, like engineering the model so that we can actually have uh, like better prediction power. So with that, on the left-hand side, uh, we compared our hybrid modeling result, which is in black with exponential data over uh, like six variables. And again, this is from the commercial scale data, which is about uh, 100,000 gallons. And on the right hand side, it shows like root mean square error table. So if you take a look at the first principle model compared to exponential data, this is the, 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 the error that we received. Um, on the other end, when you're just trying to uh, just estimate those parameters, like just tune a couple of parameters, I mean, the improve. I mean, you kind of see like some improvement in the modeling result, but actually they were not significant. But when you actually use the hybrid model, you're able to improve the uh, the modeling accuracy by far. Uh, so basically, the I the idea is that uh, we were able to identify the latent mechanism, which in this case is how the microorganism utilizes the substrate and oxygen to produce the high value products. So as a result, we were able to have actually much better. Um, prediction of power from the hybrid model. And the third example is to the reaction diffusion system. So of course, you know, we as a chemical engineers are encountering a lot of different reaction diffusion systems, but here, particularly the one that I'm gonna talk about is actually the, uh, the tumor cell growth, like cancer cell growth. So basically, um, I'm sure that if you take a look at these partial differential equations, the first term on the right hand side looks quite familiar, but for the, the cancer cell growth, we kind of have to add these second terms. And in order to briefly describe some like parameters, say the lambda is a cell proliferation. Uh, the rate is like a, how the boundary is propagating with the what velocity and so on. And kappa is a carrying capacity density and then how crowd the cells are sitting um, throughout. And these are diffusivity and so on and so forth. So basically, the idea is that we assume that diffusivity would vary with respect to space, but like in both directions, X and Y, at, uh, as well as the time, and kappa and lambda would vary with time. So in this particular cases, I mean, we assume that, uh, I mean, with this model, okay, there's no way that we can um, kind of describe the tumor growth like very accurately, but we know that this is probably the model where the general consensus has been reached. Then how can we use this model? 
and by uh, effectively adjusting this uh, diffusivity or kappa and lambda with respect to time and space, I mean, how much improvement I mean, we can expect. So this kind of the idea of using the hybrid model. And since the parameters are varying spatial temporally, we have to use hybrid model. And since we have to kind of take care of like 2D images, I mean, that's why we use like a CNN. And also for those of you who have experiences of solving the positive differential equations, you have to take care of like the relative order magnitude between the dt and dx to satisfy the safe condition. So we basically take into account all this and then develop a hybrid model for this system. So here, suppose that you are receiving like 2D images where this is like how the cells are growing into these 2D uh, directions. And basically you're gonna have a two different like a neural network layer. So the first layer is kind of being used to, to estimate the diffusivity in a spatial temporally varying manner. And then on the other end, you have a second layer where you have uh, one CNN to process the 2D image, but that is not enough because the kappa and lambda values are just like a varying with time. So you have to kind of have an additional layer to kind of change the, uh, the dimension into the one. So overall, these two kind of estimated parameter sets of estimated parameters will be used in the positive differential equations. I mean, this, this equations, which is called the porous Fisher model, and they can be used to predict the, how the cell would grow in the next time instant and so on and so forth. So if you take a look at this result slide, the left-hand side, it shows how the diffusivity changes with a spatial and a temporal manner. And then not only diffusivity, but like I said, we estimate the kappa and lambda. And then when you integrate everything into the porous facial model, on the right hand side, you see the, how the cell density um, grows with respect to time. So these are the cell density in you know, 2D images at three different time instances. And then you kind of compare the actual cell density versus like predicted cell density. So it ba basically says that we uh, we just proved that our hybrid model can be applied to like partial different partial differential equations by processing the two D images available at every sampling time. So what I'm trying to say is that all three case studies show that we can use hybrid models for identification of latent chemical mechanism through estimation of temporal or spatial temporal varying parameters. But we kind of noticed that the models developed are very system specific to some extent. Um, and they do not explicitly understand the context behind the governing uh, dynamics and making it a bit difficult for this model to be highly generalizable. So here, uh, we are trying to take the hybrid model to like next generations by enabling it to pay attention to specific underlying mechanisms behind complex chemical processes, capturing temporal dependence. So, I mean, I quote like attention because I'm gonna talk about the, the very famous paper, the, the attention is all you need, uh, which has been really the driver for all the success of ChatGPT or the large language model. So before I talk about the, how I'm gonna use this, uh, uh, you know, like attention algorithm, let me briefly talk about the, something called the transformer. So, I mean, Probably many of you already know that this a T in ChatGPT transforms like a, I mean, stand for like a transformer, and it's uh, very famous for its transfer learning capability between like language code and image recognition, and particularly like large language models in general can learn like a lot of patterns existing in the language text and code. So I mean, you know, there are many different like uh, I don't know like frameworks that are like part of the large language models. And then every week or every month, like there are new products being released. But if we talk about the existing uh, kind of a work where the transformer were being used, maybe the one thing that we can think about is using the GPT-2 um, for the flow sheet like completion, which is done by uh, the author at the, in Netherlands. And also there's a famous work by the Google Brain on AlphaFold. I think they're gonna release the AlphaFold 3 very soon, uh, which is like solving the, you know, like notorious protein folding problem. And also the transformers has been used by using like, I don't know, two, tri two to three trillion moth data to actually have a better prediction power. So, I mean, these are all very nice work, but if you were noticed, like uh, there's one thing that are very common to all these three or the most existing transform algorithm, which is that they are 
not considering like a dynamics or time series data, but they are primarily considering like a thermodynamic and calculations and so on. So uh, my interest is applying this transformer algorithm for, uh, you know, like a time series data predictions. And then of course, like there has been some work done by, I mean, like a John uh, as well. I, I was also following his a very nice work where he's trying to also use this transformer for time series uh, the forecast and use it for the model predictive control. But before we uh, kind of get into the time series thing, my thought process was that first, what makes the transformer so remarkable for all the existing systems? So in order to give you like a very brief um, overview of uh, two components of a transformer, there is one called the multi-headed attention mechanism. So it's kind of a type of self-attention to get a localized understanding. And if I were to give you a brief example, suppose that we can have like a vocabulary and the grammar and the, each one of them can be kind of handled by uh, one header, okay? So similarly, what I thought was that can we actually assign like a header to kind of understand how increasing or decreasing the temperature would affect the output? and how to change the rate of a uh, change of temperature to affect the output and so on and so forth. Because uh, we can assign each header to really do this task. But what is more important is something called the positional encoding. So, I mean, if you think about this a very simple sentence, like I am a robot, okay? And then if I ask you to provide some indexing of this a very simple sentence, I think first thing that come to your mind is probably zero, one, two, three, right? I mean, this is fine. This is a very nice way to index this particular sequence. But the problem is that from this one particular vector, you can only get one piece of positional information, right? I mean, from this, you can only get information like, well, I am a robot. They are all positions with equidistant, right? However, with that one piece of information, so you cannot get a lot of like context. But for example, if you're going to use like a sine or cosine functions, and then for each one of them, if you kind of vary like a frequency, and so on as a force, then basically for each one of them, if you apply by plugging this like integer index into this like sine functions with different frequencies, then you're going to get another piece of information regarding the relative positional information of each word within the sentence, right? And then if you kind of, okay, fine, then you only have a four additional pieces of information and probably with that, we cannot do much, but what if we change the sequence to be like entire thesis? And if you change the number of positional encoding to be like 10,000 or 100,000, right? Then basically what you're trying to do is that from so many sentences within like this is you're trying to identify the relative position inf information of each word from this sentence. And then basically you want to do that for the many, many sentences. Then basically what you're trying to do is that by analyzing, by studying, or by filling the blank of uh, so many sentences that you are understanding what's the role, what's the most likely uh, relative positional information of AM, right? Relative to I or A and so on and so forth. So by doing which, people were able to really train like a lot of uh, machine learning models using like text data. And that really has been the uh, reason for the success of a ChatGPT. And this is exactly the, I mean, the way the ChatGPT has been trained. So I thought the similar idea can be applicable to like a time series data. So suppose that you have like a time t is equal to zero, the temperature is like 50 and the one hour becomes like 45, two hours becomes like 30, which basically means there's particular context behind this change. And of course, in the case of text data, the the particular, uh, like the underlying mechanism was a context. But here in this time series data, what really enables this change is actually the dynamics. So by doing the positional encoding, by studying the relative, the positional information of this temperature at different time relative to 50 and 30, we can understand the dynamics behind this uh, time series data. So by utilizing this uh, multi-headed attention mechanism and also positional encoding, we developed something called the crystal GPT. So the idea is that we apply the transformer into the crystal GPT and the, we call it TST because, you know, the chat GPT was released like in November, 2022. And then by the time we are trying to develop this crystal GPT, there are 
almost zero. I mean, but very few works where they're considered transformer for the time series data. And then uh, we are trying to uh, make the really the case by applying to the crystallization process. So suppose that you have like a 20 batch data, which has like temperature profile concentration or a size distribution like mu or a seeding profile and so on and so forth, and from which you can develop like a crystal GPT, okay? And so crystal GPT is like a transformer model only, it's like fully data data model and then from which you can predict what will happen to like a 21st or 22nd crystallizing the processes and when you apply like a new input profile, okay? So the one thing that I want to really highlight is that, well, we see a lot of the success with the crystal GPT, it performed very well, but you know, although it's a very sophisticated, the crystal GPT is still like a fully data video model, okay? So what we tried to do was that we want to integrate this crystal GPT with a system agnostic first principle model to really develop like a time series transformer based hybrid model for crystallizations because we do have a like a lot of physics known for crystallization process so what we did was that if you remember the general structure of the hybrid model we have like first prince model here and then we had like a dnn but instead of using dnn i replace it with a time series transformer so what it could do is that if the operating condition changes then based on which this uh, crystal GPT was able to predict the most important parameters associated with the crystallization, which is like growth rate and the nucleation rate. And those are being fed into the first principle model. And then together, this hybrid model will predict what will become like crystal size distributions or yield at the end of the process, which are two most important like the output variables with respect to like crystallization process. So here, I would say this is for the first time, like transformer model has been used along with the first principle model to really to really create the hybrid model and that has been applied to the crystallization systems. And this is kind of result of the crystallization systems about due to the interest time, I will just skip this slide. And we also use this hybrid modeling approach for some really uh, important cell signal pathway. So here, I mean, suppose you have an like entry of the pathogen and then within your body, there's a macrophage, and then it will create like uh, some signals to your, to the subsequent cell signaling pathway so that your body, your entire body systems can understand that there is a, a kind of attack by this uh, pathogen from outside. And this is exactly what was happening during COVID uh, like within your body. So you can say this is like input, this is like a system, this is like output. So, you know, the key thing is that if we were to provide a relatively reasonable mathematical model for this, like a rather uh, simple systems, you actually have to consider like a 50 states and the 150 parameters. Okay. So, I mean, but the problem is that there are only two measurements available. One is the TNF alpha and the other one is the collection of all these four protein. So the idea is that given that we have uh, this uh, two measurement available, and then uh, we know that our first principle model is not uh, very good, what can we do actually uh, to actually find uh, the better parameter values for which parameters, and then as a result, how much improvement can we expect? So basically here, we kind of use like graph theory type of approach to find given that we have a uh, two measurement available, out of 150 parameters or what would be the, up to how many parameters that we can identify with the confidence. And then we suppose there are two, then like, the, I mean, there will be like 150 combination, two possibilities and out of which, uh, like which combinations uh, should be considered. So we actually completed all those work and then applied to like a real um, systems. And here, as you can see, um, I mean, due to interest time, I'll just skip it. But uh, I mean, you can see that the one with the error bar is experimental data. And the one with the dashed line is when we use the first principle model only. And the one with the red is basically after we use the hybrid model. Okay. I mean, this paper is published in the PLOS Computational Biology. So if you're interested, then maybe you can send me an email and then I'll be more than happy to share these papers and talk about the details. So. Um, the next one is that, I mean, based on the fermentation model that we developed, okay, I mean, we applied that to the control design. So, I mean, like I said, we were working on this like commercial scale, like a hundred thousand gallon, you know, like a fermentation process. 
which has like a phase one and phase two. So phase one is about 24 hours. This is like a kind of batch. Phase two is like a fat batch, which takes about 280 hours and so on and so forth. So we wanted to use the hybrid model for control design, but there is a one step that we have to do, take care of right away, which is designing the soft sensor. Because, you know, like a sensor is required to accurately estimate the internal state of the process. Because if you have ever experiences with working on like fermentation process, there are a lot of issues, but first of all, it has a very limited online measurement and it has a frequent and asynchronous sampling interval. And lastly, even though you measure some like variables, but some of them are still like inaccurate. So basically, you know, with this thing, you know, we cannot design any controller, which doesn't even make sense. So we kind of developed something called like a multi-ray software sensor by taking into account all the available like online, offline uh, information, like measurement. Within the soft sensor, we use the hybrid model that we developed. And the, in the end, the reason why we call it multi-rate is that we were able to synchronize all the infrequent asynchronous sampling intervals. And also we were able to provide the values. Um, so it's like a state estimator, right? Soft sensor. So we were able to provide the values for like unmeasurable states as well. So this is like a brief um, demonstration of the performance. So case one is that we assume that all the measurements out of these six, so there are like four uh, measurements available and then from which we were trying to estimate like uh, non-measurable states. And case two, which is this one, um, is that we assume that only, so case one is like a, uh, the, uh, simulation study in the case two is like a real study. In the case two, you see that some of them has like the red dot, which is like experiment data, but with a different interval, right? So for example, like product is available in every like point one. Um, and then like, a, you know, like a S2, which is like a second substrate or X2, uh, they are also available with a different interval. So basically uh, we were able to provide like good accuracy for even for the, bo the biomass uh, concentration, which is not available in real time. So we were able to show that our soft sensor is working very well. And given that we have a soft sensor, the next step is that we designed the controller. So we wanted to maximize, or our sponsor was wanting to maximize the product amount and the primary unit while maintaining the process constraints and obtaining the optimal operating conditions of the product. So the thing is that, of course, it makes sense to maximize the product uh, by also minimizing the use of a utility or the you know, food like substrate. But the thing is that the company, I mean, this process is commercial scales has been operated for many, many years and they have their own like golden batch type approach. So they had so many constraints. So like when we first interview all the constraints and the you know optimization based model product control problems, it becomes infeasible. So we had to talk to companies and release some of the constraints, for example, like rather than having this uh, S2, like second substrate concentration to be at their own optimal value. So we kind of introduced that, well, can we, you know, introduce like 25% of a margin, like plus and minus so that we have a little bit of additional degree of freedoms and so on and so forth. So by taking into account all the constraints after talking to them, uh, within our MPC, we use the hybrid model and then we also use the observer, but here I mean like soft sensor and then we were able to really solve it. And then as a result, this is the, what we achieved. So if you take a look at the left-hand side, this is actually the result of the, uh, the, I mean, the real systems by manipulating the input profile, which is on the right-hand side as follows. Okay, so by adjusting these three uh, input variables, so we were able to achieve uh, actually like a very, I would say, uh, like an ambitious goal. So they provide that the product has to be like that while the S2 concentration stays, I mean, around these particular conditions and say volume should not go beyond whatever the value. So we were able to meet pretty much most of their constraints. And as a result, we were able to improve their productivity by 10% by lowering the utility or the, uh, the raw material cost by 15%. So at the moment, we are in the process of, you know, like validating this result with their real process um, um, in Japan uh, near Takasago. And then actually visited like last month to have an additional discussion. This is like an ongoing thing. So, uh, 
I've been talking about all the results that we have in terms of having the model. And then I, now I just want to maybe spend like the last uh, three to four minutes to talk about the future of the time series transformer based hybrid model. So additionally, what we are trying to do is that, I mean, you know, there's like a quantitative structure property relationship like QSPR, right? Where people are trying to estimate like the thermodynamic properties from like the structure. So but you know, if we just use like a hundred structures and hundred like properties, and if you use machine learning model, what it does is more like interpolations, right? However, I mean, what we are trying to do is that, you know, if we have these particular structures and then we can actually represent this 2D structure using something like a text, and this is called like a SMILES format, right? And then if we trained, say like a transformer model, basically by using many different this smart format, then we can basically predict that the third thermodynamic property is fairly well. And then I'm gonna talk about this training process a little bit here. And I'll first talk about the data that we are using. So there is a data sources called like a zinc and pop cam available, um, like, you know, um, and then it has about the 1.8 billion. So maybe in early 2000, it only is like a six, 600,000, but you know, it's kind of keep building up because every year there's more and more patents are expired and then more like chemicals are moved to like a generic. So by utilizing, you know, this 1.8 billion structures, and then we do have all the texturized representations of this thing. So for example, for those of you who are not familiar with the SMAS format, Suppose you have these particular molecular structures and you can actually represent it by using this uh, text like alphabet with the numbers and the small parenthesis or bracket and so on and so forth or so equal sign. So these two are one-to-one -one map, okay? So for example, if we have like primidone, then you can have a small format, but then the way that we are going to train is that similar to what ChatGPT did, we are going to maybe mask this particular atom and then try to have the machine learning model to guess by going from right to left and then left to right, okay? And then if you do this for maybe like uh, not only 1.8 million, but maybe 2 billion, 3 billion, then in the end, we can understand something called like a universal chemical language. And, and basically it can understand the, how all these molecules are, particularly atoms with these molecules are being connected. And then if we happen to miss particular positions, then the the machine learning model, like the pre-trained model, which can understand like universal chemical language, it can actually guess it, okay? So that state is actually more like, say like we just understand how uh, all these structures are being related, but that is not sufficient, but I still gonna call it as like, we can understand like universal chemical language. But on top of that, if we're going to do like a fine tuning, so for the fine tuning steps, like you don't need a lot of like compounds, maybe just like a thousand structures and thousand properties are sufficient. If you're going to do like a fine tuning using this like a thousand structures only, then since this the pre-trained the model can understand like universal chemical language, it can actually extrapolate it to like a billion or two billion or three billion structures. So I mean here, I'm not trying to say is that, well, whatever we learned from these a thousand structures, it can be all correctly um, extrapolated to like three billions. But according to our study, uh, actually there R scale, R square value for these extrapolations is actually greater than 1.98. And so this is for like a solubility predictions and we can also do like a solvation free energy or other variables, because as you can see, there are so many data sources for the fine tuning and then we do have a, uh, this is a pre-trained model, okay? So once we have this pre-trained model by adding these fine tuning layers, which maybe consist of like thousand chemical structures or something, we can train it within just like maybe uh, within a week and then we can actually have a very good prediction power. And then, so what I'm trying to say is that I just completed like, you know, predicting. So from the chemical structures, like, this chemical structures all the way to like uh, thermodynamic properties, but that is not sufficient because we as a chemical engineer sometimes have to do like modeling of a chemical process, right? So we try to do like a uh, develop additional transform model so that we can actually predict 
the kinetic parameters are from this like a uh, smart format. And then once these two parameters are obtained, then for example, in case of crystallization process, we are going to use these two parameters within the first principle model by creating the hybrid model so that we can actually predict like the overall like crystal size distributions at the end. Okay, so I mean, that's kind of the goal of this study where we are trying to uh, kind of further uh, develop like a transformer model based type of model. So, I mean, suppose that if we provide like chemical st structure only, then you can predict like kinetic parameters like growth rate or growth rate index. And then, which basically means that now we have uh, uh, growth rate expressions available from the structure. And then we have a solubility data available from the structure and by integrating these two and then by running the process for some period of time, you can actually predict the crystal size distributions at the end of the process. And basically this can be used to kind of determine like high level go and no go decision making. Suppose like some pharma companies purchase like or discover the new molecules and they don't have enough time to do a lot of kinetic and thermodynamic studies. Then they can basically use our model to kind of determine the high level go and no go decisions. And so what we are trying to do here is that by sacrificing accuracy a little bit, um, but we are claiming that we can probably achieve like better generalizability and then you will drastically improve the practical utility of the hybrid model. So, and we are also working on like a fermentation process with exactly the same idea. And then uh, there is called the transformer, like a transformer plus fermentation. And in case of this crystallization systems, we call it like crystal former, uh, but you know, these are all under uh, patent right now. And then we are uh, publishing, trying to publish these papers in different journals as well. So with that, um, thank you for your time. Um, and then if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to um, answer. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you, Professor Kwan. I really appreciate that presentation and the great work at uh, going into the theory, the methods, but also some motivating applications as well. Um, we are just get ready for the question and answer. Please post any questions to the chat window. Also, please try out uh, the AI companion as well, maybe as a first pass, see if that answers a question. And we'd love to hear your feedback on that as well. So you can unmute your microphone or you can type a question in the chat window. Um, so just get started. I have a couple questions here. Um, what's You mentioned you know physics informed. Um, you know, there's kind of this idea that these neural network models don't extrapolate very well, but it seems like you're going at it from kind of a different direction for some of these applications where the physics-based model is, you said, 80 to 90% of the predictive capability, and then the neural network provides the parameters. Um, do you, does this overcome that extrapolation issue? I mean, what are your thoughts on that if you had to move more toward an application where you don't really have a physics-based model? Yeah, so basically uh, we are also um, kind of doing the exactly the same approach. So, I mean, you know, um, my idea is that, um, you know, even though we have like a fairly new processes, but, you know, we live in 2024 and then we can find like reasonably good first principle model for the systems and then, um, I mean, let's say we see that there's some general consensus has been made that, well, this first print model is not sufficient, but it would be probably the best at the moment model to use for these particular systems. And with that, what can we do? Okay, I mean, how can we further improve the accuracy of the first person model? So I'm saying that maybe in the particular cases, this kind of approach is very feasible because we do have some working first print model and that we do have some experimental data uh, which basically means that you know we can use them to find the neural network which will really fill the knowledge gap. But what we are also trying to do at the moment is that we can say uh, we can adjust the level or the, I mean the level of uh, the amount of physics that is being included as a part of the first principle model, and then by adjusting the level maybe we can have a different uh, ratio between the contribution by the neural network and first principle model. Maybe we can have a, like, we can start with the one to nine, but two to eight, seven, uh, three to seven, all the way to maybe nine to one. Then by comparing those, we can actually see, you know, even though we vary like intentionally the contribution by the neural network and first principle model, 
but it's still the, the, the missing physics captured by the neural network. Do we kind of see like any consistent feature from that? Then, I mean, we can, I think, kind of claim in the end that, well, this is a really uh, the missing physics that we want to find. Okay, great. I, yeah, go ahead, Mudis here. Uh, yes, hi there. This is Mudasa Rashid from uh, IIT. I'm an assistant professor. Uh, hey. Joseph, nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I, I had a question similar to what John was talking about, where you have a, a machine learning component or a neural network component that estimates the parameters. But oftentimes, not just the parameters are unknown, but even the structure of the first principles model may not be known. Could you kind of combine this with like sparse identification of uh, uh, model structure? So you're estimating maybe parameters and model structures simultaneously? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's actually a very good approach. Uh, so, like, sparse identification might be a very good one in terms of maybe the regulating the richness of the first principle model. Uh, but sometimes, you know, even though we adjust those, say, like, sparsity promoting parameter like coefficient, but, you know, we don't know exactly which terms will be dropped or which terms will be retained. So instead, we are wanting to do more like a hands-on approach where, I mean, like I said, suppose that we have some surface model where the, this particular interaction can be considered or, so, you know, like we can actually add or consider more and more complex physics as a part of the first principle model, right? But then maybe we have like four different or five different first principle model candidate, right? I, I mean, so maybe the, the, the most complex one will include everything, and then the less complex one will include maybe four out of five and so on and so forth. And then we are forcing the missing piece to be, you know, complemented or supplemented by this neural network. So, I mean, rather than going with one particular first principle model, what we are trying to do now, I mean, even though I didn't present it today, is that we are going to vary the complexity of the first principle model and then have the rest to be fulfilled by the neural network. And then we have maybe five to seven different, uh, the hybrid model, and then we'll compare if there is any consistency in the neural network model or the missing physics that is identified the neural network model. I think this is a bit aligned with uh, uh, what your suggestions, right? Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Okay, fantastic. We have time for one more question. All right, I've got one more here. Um, so you've had, let's see, so this one says, you've had a lot of experience with crystallization, fermentation, and fracking. Uh, what are some of the challenges in scaling from simulation to real industrial data? Um, I'm kind of wondering if the questions can be further kind of spelled out. Um, like, like, John. I guess. Uh, I mean, is it your questions or some someone else's questions? Uh, so yeah, this is uh one of the questions, uh, private question. Okay. Okay. Um, sure. 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 So, what I guess the I'm guessing that the question is, what are some of the issues when you start dealing with data from sensors, uh, you know, versus you know working with a first principles model, kind of like a academic case study. It okay. sounds like you've had good experience with both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, because I think it's kind of a opening kind of warm because it can lead to too much discussions, but so particularly those who ask these questions, if you're interested, you can maybe send me an email. I'm more than happy to uh, share my own experiences. But to make long story short, I mean, like I said earlier, uh, typically when we you know, kind of work. So at the moment, now we are trying to work with like a battery companies, but you know, they have a lot of data, but they are pretty much like similar. So even though they provide like hundred batches, it's almost like maybe 97 nearly identical batches with the three slightly different batches. So, you know, even though they can claim that they have provided hundred batches, but from our end, from the standpoint of training the hybrid model, it's maybe only like four or five batches. So I think that's actually pros and cons of working with somebody who, or some companies who already have uh, reached like commercial scale level because they cannot vary too much, particularly if they are producing like a vaccine 
which you know cost about like multi million or multi tens of million dollars for batch. You know they cannot do like any you know simple like modifications. However, if there are some other companies like whose each batch takes about like not much, then they can actually do a lot of uh, manipulations so that we can actually have a really like a uh, uh, diverse like uh, uh, the data sets. So this is one thing, and then in terms of you know collecting the sensors and data, I mean, like I mean this is like one of the reasons why we are interested in or we have developed soft sensors because although they provide the data, sometimes there is a gap between what they can collect versus what they can like predict or they do they want to predict they want to control. So we can fill the knowledge gap by developing the soft sensor which also requires us to use a hybrid model. So, I mean, this is like a brief, very general high level um, response to the questions, but if someone who raised the questions are interested, I mean, you're more than welcome to contact me. Hey, fantastic. Well, thanks again for your excellent presentation and great uh, question and answer session as well. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining as well and uh, appreciate that uh, you were able to join we'll have an, our next webinar uh, next week um, so stay tuned for that thank you john thank you so much